NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. I am delighted to moderate a program on Second Look, which I really think is kind of the way forward for us with the problems of mass incarceration. Uh, it's really, the, 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 it's, it's a seismic issue to try to address the number of people incarcerated and the number of people serving very long sentences. And it's, it's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And the only way truly that we're ever going to be able to get the workforce and the, the, the attention to those individuals is through mobilization of our judiciary and, and, the, and the workforce at the judicial level. Um, so our, we have three distinguished panelists today. They're all going to present to you individually in shorter segments, and then we'll have a discussion to the extent we can have a discussion while they're presenting. We're gonna try and do that too. Um, Nicole Porter will be our first presenter. She's the Director of Advocacy at the Sentencing Project, where she's worked for over a decade on state sentencing reform, collateral consequences of criminal convictions, and prison conditions. Prior to that, she directed a prison accountability project in Texas, which monitored the conditions of confinement of state prisoners in Texas. And um, she also, uh, uh, her master's thesis, which I just want to comment on briefly, was presciently um, uh, focused on the experience, the work experiences of those who were formerly incarcerated. And I, I kind of want to talk to you more about that, Nicole, later. Um, uh, David Garlick will be our second uh, speaker. He is the successful returning citizen who served 13 years in an Alabama prison, along with his brother, for um, uh, killing their abuser. Since his release on parole eight years ago, he's obtained his BA and assumed leadership positions in several nonprofits focused on prison reform and reentry, including the Straight Ahead organization and the Lancaster County Reentry Coalition. And I'm going to not get this one right because I didn't write it down, but um, the National um, Association for uh, Rational Sex Offenses, which I also think just sounds like such a terrific initiative, David. Um, I will add, he also appeared in the movie, Just Mercy. Um, James Dold is the CEO and founder of Human Rights for Kids, an organization inspired by his own personal experiences of child sex abuse and child labor trafficking. He grew up in very deprived circumstances and was the only person among his seven siblings to graduate from high school went on to go to college and then to graduate from law school. He worked as an advocate for social justice in various positions, including on Capitol Hill, uh, Human Rights for Kids, which he founded in 2017, advocates for a range of child justice reform issues, including due process protections for children, for child defendants, elimination of mandatory sentencing for child defendants, and removal of children from adult prisons. And with that, I'm gonna ask Nicole to proceed and we'll put up the PowerPoint and get started. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you so much, Jane Ann, and um, good afternoon, everyone. You know, I want to thank um, NACDL for including me in this important discussion. And for those of you that don't know, the Sentencing Project is a research and advocacy organization that has been around since the mid-1980s. We launched a campaign to end life imprisonment at the end of 2018 that can be found online at endlifeimprisonment.org. So while I'm going to focus my comments on numbers, I know that behind each of these numbers is a young Black man or woman who has been disappeared to mass incarceration. Behind each percentage point is a Latinx child who has to visit their parent in a prison waiting room. And behind the data set are families and entire communities whose members have been extracted due to extreme sentencing. Can we go to the next slide, please? And the one after that. Thank you. So, oh, you can go back to the, to the previous slide. Um, so, second look policies are needed, and this really builds off of what Jane Ann was saying earlier because of the extreme sentencing that has contributed to mass incarceration. It's probably no surprise to this audience, but a mix of policies and practices have contributed to mass incarceration, and the United States continues to be the world's number one jailer. Since the 1980s and the 
in the National Academies of Sciences found this in its highly regarded study from 2014, that residents, particularly those in majority black neighborhoods have had higher chance of incarceration uh, because they've had a higher chance of coming in contact with the police. Once residents have that higher chance of coming in contact with the police, there's a higher chance of being arrested. Once arrested, a higher chance of going to prison. And once in prison, a higher chance of being in prison for longer. Contributing to these factors is the expansion of mandatory crime, of mandatory time served requirements, truth and sentencing policies, particularly contributing to longer sentences for those with prior convictions and the elimination of parole that has contributed to longer prison terms. And what the sentencing project defines as a virtual life sentence or person sentenced to 50 years or longer. Next slide, please. In terms of life sentences, one out of every seven persons in prison is there for a life sentence. That's more than 203,000 persons in prison on life with parole, life without parole, or virtual life sentences. Currently, the number of persons sentenced to life without parole has never been higher. There's a 66% increase since 2003. The expansion of life without parole and particularly mandatory life without parole as a sentencing option has contributed to this growth. The United States has extremely punitive sentencing structure that sets it apart from other Western nations. The persistent use of the death penalty establishes a high crime response that legitimates life sentences and life without parole sentences for even progressive activists. But the entire sentencing structure, including life sentences, are extreme, and that makes this discussion a very important one. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, just to go back, second luck reforms must be a part of the ongoing discussion to recalibrate the nation's extreme sentencing practices. Now, I define second look, and I think this aligns with NAP with NACDL's definition as a judicial review that should ideally be automatic for all defendants after a term of years or as a result of a petition by a legal practitioner or the petitioner themselves. I'd like to get into that definition specifically in the Q&A if there's any distance between what I've described and what NACDL is working towards. Hopefully state strategies can center recommendations rooted in the model penal code, which recommends sentence reviews at 10 or 15 years for, and aligns with several values. One is to reflect society's evolving norms. And another is to recognize the science that most individuals age out of crime. Now, these arguments don't minimize accountability for someone guilty of their crime or con of conviction, but contribute to an expanding space that recognizes people, including those who have committed violence and very serious offenses might one day no longer be a threat to public safety. So getting into this slide specifically with public safety and life imprisonment, examining the relation to crime to imprisonment is critical in the context of second look reform discussions and to understand the uninformed perspectives that have driven crime policy over the last 50 years. The continued experience of growth of imprisonment, even as crime declined in the 90s, reinforced that while incarceration can incapacitate those who are most at risk of committing crime, the underlying circumstances of crime, including poverty and racist social control practices, cannot be addressed by the criminal legal system alone. The circumstances of a particular crime, which is often situational and exacerbated by drugs and alcohol, might be addressed by some imprisonment, but the extreme term of years that defendants are subjected to today exceeds what is served by the legal system. This is important to keep in mind given current increases in crime, yet continued interest as evidenced by the people who joined um, this call to recalibrate the nation's extreme sentencing policies. Both can be true at the same time, that even in the context of rising crime, there are people currently in prison who have been there for too long, should have a second look, and the policies that contribute to their current imprisonment have to be revisited. Next slide, please. So there's an opportunity that allows us to strategize and think intentionally about what should come next. There are a mix of strategies to advance second look in other reforms. Currently, the most progressive strategy is one that was adopted in the District of Columbia last year that expands its second look policy 
to allow persons who are 25 or younger at the time of their crime of conviction to have a sentence review hearing after 15 years of imprisonment. According to an estimate by the Sentencing Project, 29% of currently imprisoned district residents are eligible for resentencing under this reform. Other second look policies are pending or have been considered in states from Iowa to Oklahoma. Another second look reform is the expansion of those who can petition for sentence review hearings. In 2018, the California Assembly expanded resentencing to include prosecutors and led the establishment of sentence review units in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Other localities have also established sentence review units, including localities in Baltimore City and Milwaukee. Building on this practice can start with legislation, but could also start locally with prosecutorial officials establishing a sentencing review units or other local officials establishing them with, again, the goal to revisit the two long sentences that thousands, tens of thousands of residents have been subjected to. Although not adopted, a model legislative policy to point persons to is the federal Booker Bill um, sponsored by Senator Cory Booker out of New Jersey that would authorize any person with a federal sentence, regardless of the crime of conviction, to have a sentence review after 10 years of imprisonment. The bill includes a range of factors to be considered at the sentencing review that balances the person's age, work at rehabilitation and personal development against their crime of conviction. And lastly, there's an emerging network of case advocacy that will hopefully lay the groundwork for statutory reform. I know many of these entrepreneurial criminal defense attorneys are involved in um, NACDL's, ne in NACDL's network and among the NOCDL membership. There's the Beyond Guilt Initiative pioneered by the Ohio Justice and Policy Center that has successfully sought release for clients subjected to too long sentences. The, similarly, there's the Illinois Prison Project that has successfully sought commutations for persons subjected to life imprisonment for robbery offenses. So next slide, please. So I'm going to um, wrap up my comments here, but wanted to leave these um, bullets as suggestions for ways to, to, uh, for next steps to think about. I hope my comments have been helpful and I'm looking forward to hearing from the other panelists and learning more during the q and I'm also grateful to NACDL um, to continue to create space in learning around Second Look amongst its members and the broader advocacy community. I think as we move forward in seriously considering Second Look reforms, having continued discussions like this one, thinking about practical ways to apply pending legislation or model reform at, um, suggested by that federal Booker bill is are some next steps for us all to be considering. And, you know, these, these um, model, the model legislation as in the Booker bill and the other reforms that have been adopted in DC and the sentence review units that have been adopted in the localities around the country can be the start of conversation amongst organizers and advocates thinking about practical next steps in, in advocacy um, efforts. So I'll wrap up my comments there. And again, um, you know, look forward to continuing discussion and then also want to invite anyone with questions to reach out to me directly and I can help follow up on that. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, you actually, uh, when you gave your definition of the second look, this really did dovetail with the NACTO proposal and the second look proposal um, from the model penal code and Booker II, um, this automatic review after a certain number of years, but you added the petition, this idea that there could be outside the automatic review, there would be an opportunity to petition. You talked about prosecutors being able to petition. Do you have some other thoughts about how, um, oh darn, my dog would bark right now. Um, other thoughts about other, perhaps scenarios where someone could petition before an automatic review period? Well, I think if, um, I, I think one goal served by an automatic petition would help to minimize any bias or discretion that comes with picking which cases should be subject for review because there's bias throughout the criminal justice continuum that can be amongst the legal practitioners who might um, have the authority and discretion to pick which cases can be reviewed, the judges, if, you know, and how their bias shows up. 
So hopefully that automatic requirement minimizes any bias that might implicit or explicit that might surface in the context of whatever the review framework is. And then I think there's other aspects of agency to consider to empower people directly impacted the person, the petitioner, the person in prison subjected to a two extreme sentence, and perhaps others, um, advocates. So who else can be in the in the conversation? Perhaps there are other advocates who can help support their directly impacted loved one, um, who can also be included. I don't think that there should be any limitations on who can bring the petition. I think that is broader framework as developed could include a, you know, an attorney advocate, another advocate, including the individual, because there are so many legal advocates and case advocates behind the walls that they can engage um, in that too. And then much of the work under the progressive ad, you know, prosecutor discussion has focused on prosecutors revisiting two extreme sentences that were imposed 30, 20 years ago. And so their agency and their authority and discretion in this has really been the subject of a great deal of attention over the last couple of years. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here with you all. Uh, James Dold again from Human Rights for Kids. And I, at the outset, I just want to, you know, begin to highlight um, a couple of things. One, uh, some of these second look reforms have been passing, particularly as it relates to children uh, who've been convicted of serious crimes all over the country. So if you're a defense attorney and you're wondering, how can I get involved to support this work? Uh, there are tons of people out there right now who are all convicted of, as children of, of serious crimes who really need quality legal counsel to assist them in their cases. Uh, Maryland just passed past second look legislation for all children, giving more than 400 people the opportunity to go back before a judge and have their sentences reviewed. Uh, the Baltimore City Public Defender's Office is actually coordinating pro bono legal counsel. So if you're an attorney in Maryland, or if you're not, you can waive in pro hoc vici and still represent folks. Uh, over in Virginia, it's not a judicial sentencing review mechanism, it's a parole mechanism, but they need attorneys there in the pro board hearings. Uh, Ohio just passed the same law, allowing all of those kids to have the opportunity for judicial sentencing review. So really, you know, in many states across the country, a judicial uh, sentencing review and parole review opportunities, sort of these quote unquote second look reforms have passed allowing kids the, the opportunity to, to have these uh, opportunities to go back into court or before a parole board. And we really need quality legal representation uh, to engage on these issues and represent clients. And so I would definitely encourage folks that, uh, you know, are interested in this issue, who want to be involved, who want to represent clients. Uh, there are ways to get involved, even if you're not a member of the bar of a particular state, uh, to start representing these cases. Because, you know, really passing the legislation is just half the battle, right? It, it doesn't really matter unless people get the chance to come home. And that's something that we really need to keep in mind as these reforms are passing. So in order to implement them effectively, uh, we need lawyers taking on cases. So I just want to highlight that for folks who are listening, who are wondering, how can I get involved? Uh, there, there are plenty of ways, and I'd be happy to uh, send some some resources to folks if you have questions on how you can you can be engaged. My talk really, um, you know, I, I centered, you know, the, the title of my discussion around this human rights framing and in part because uh, what we've seen in the United States, particularly as it relates to children in Second Look, is this need to use a broader human rights frame when we're talking about uh, kids in the justice system and, and what happens to them. And for folks that might not be familiar, uh, the use of life in prison without parole or even de facto life without parole or lengthy prison terms, as we would uh, call them, uh, is a violation of international human rights standards. Uh, Article 37 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child categorically prohibits the use of the death penalty and life without parole sentences on children. The United States is the only country that has not ratified this treaty, making us a global outlier in our treatment of youth. Folks may remember that Justice Kennedy actually uh, cited uh, to the prevailing human rights consensus around the world in 2005 in Roper v. Simmons, when the court struck down the use of the death penalty on children. And so this human rights framing is a very important uh, consideration and, and framing uh, for both Republican and Democratic lawmakers alike when we're thinking about uh, how children should be treated in the justice system. So part of our role, you know, in, in passing these laws and, and really getting lawmakers to understand the necessity of providing second look opportunities to children is reframing the conversation. 
I think we're going to hear a little bit about this later on in, in David's remarks. Uh, but, you know, there's been this tendency for so long uh, in, in society and in, in the criminal legal system to focus in on what the child has done in order to allow them to come into the system to begin with, to, you know, to use these excessive sentences against them. And we never really focus on what led the child to the system to begin with, right? We sort of strip them of their victim status. And the reality is the vast majority of children who come into our system are dealing with incredibly complex trauma uh, and have been exposed to all sorts of violence, whether it's you know prior child sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, neglect, uh, the ACEs scores, the adverse childhood experiences scores of children in the justice system, both juvenile as well as those kids who are subject to uh, transfer and a prosecution in adult court are just absolutely through the roofs, and we need to make sure that we're accounting for this in how we talk about youth and how we respond uh, in the first instances to children who uh, come into conflict with all, even with those kids who commit ser very serious uh, offenses. Um, and I have a stat up on the um, up on the PowerPoint that kind of highlights just the prevalence of of trauma and the amount of violence that children have been exposed to prior to them uh, entering the system. The the more serious the crime, typically we see the the higher the ACE score, the more trauma that a child's been exposed to, which highlights the importance for mitigation on the front end for sentencing hearings in general, but also when lawyers are representing these kids in second look opportunities, the importance for effective and comprehensive mitigation work to look into the backgrounds of the child to really paint a clear picture of how they ended up in the system to begin with. Uh, next slide, please. So as I was mentioning before, you know, adverse childhood experiences, you know, the, the key determining factor for most of our kids' involvement in the justice system. We can go to the next slide. This is kind of what I mentioned. I do want to highlight a couple of things here, and I I need to shout out the uh, the sentencing project. Actually, this is the product of the work of Ashley Nellis, um, who uh, many years ago did a comprehensive uh, analysis of juvenile lifers all over the country. Um, at that time, before Miller v. Alabama was decided in 2012, um, and I think Ashley's uh, research was actually even before that. Nicole will have a better sense uh, of that than I would. Uh, but you know, one of the things that her research sort of you know specifically found was that you know, when we're looking at you know, the prevalence of violence witnessed in, in juvenile lifers' homes, over 80% of them, 54% uh, had witnessed violence in their, in their neighborhoods on a regular and ongoing basis. 80% of girls and 50% of all children were physically abused. And 77% of girls and 20% of boys were sexually abused. So you know, you step back and you think about that, uh, particularly the staff for girls, um, you know, to, to know that uh, you know, more than 75% of all the girls who were sentenced to life without parole were previously sexually abused, uh, you know, should really cause all of us to sort of step back and say, wow, like, what is going on with our system where we don't have a system that can really, you know, accurately capture and treat the children who come into our system. But this, you know, data is key uh, to how we really reframed the conversation in state legislatures and with policymakers across the country to make them comfortable with these second look opportunities, right? There are a number of factors that came into it. Part of it was, you know, the Supreme Court cases that came down between 2005 and even more, you know, more recently in 2016 with Montgomery v. Louisiana. But another part was, again, reframing who these kids were uh, for policymakers. And I think it's helpful uh, reframing for everybody in the system because we know, you know, the, the, the old axiom, hurt people, hurt people, right? And so getting people to understand the role that trauma plays uh, in crime in general is going to be really helpful in getting buy-in for these sorts of reforms. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, you know, uh, earlier, they, you know, at the time Miller came down, there were over 2,500 children sentenced to life without parole. Thankfully, because of these reforms to the legislature, as well as um, uh, the resentencing process under Miller and Montgomery, you know, we've seen a significant reduction in that population. Uh, we filed a brief a couple of years ago. Ironically, it was cited um, in both, uh, it actually more recently in the Jones v. Mississippi decision, unfortunately. Uh, we've uh, filed a brief on behalf of state policymakers highlighting that, you know, uh, there was a real need to make sure that we were protecting children from life without parole sentences. Um, and what we noted in that brief that at the time, uh, 
in that, in that case, it was Malvo v. Mathena that the court had granted cert in. At the time that they had granted cert in that case, there were only four states really that hadn't taken any action in light of Miller v. Alabama and Montgomery v. Louisiana that wasn't consistent with the broad conception and reading of those decisions. And so thankfully, we saw a lot of states in, in light of those rulings uh, you know, get rid of life without parole entirely through these second look opportunities, as well as the state courts make sure that they uh, had this opportunity to go back into court and argue for a sentence other than life without parole. Next slide, please. Uh, be remiss if we didn't talk about racial disparities. Um, since Miller came down in 2012, um, it, over 70% of kids, new kids who received life without parole sentences are black. Um, you know, and this is something that, you know, everyone on this call and who's participating, I, I'm sure is aware of. Um, racial disparities are particularly uh, acute when we're talking about uh, black, black and brown children. Um, even prior to Miller, 60% uh, of all the juvenile lifer cases involve black youth. And so it's really important to highlight because when we're talking about second look reforms, uh, a key part of this is a, is a racial justice and racial equity issue, because those are the people who are going to be mostly impacted by these sorts of reforms when they pass. Next slide, please. So I wanted to include on this map, um, and this is of 2020. So I mentioned a couple of states recently that I just passed the legislation, Ohio and Maryland being the most recent ones. Um, so it kind of gives you a sense of, you know, where some of these reforms uh, have begun to pass. So now this map here specifically is just bans on juvenile life without parole, which could also include second look reforms, but not exclusively. So for example, uh, Vermont, it just has a ban on life without parole. It doesn't address de facto life without parole sentences. And it's important that, you you know, when we're looking at sort of addressing the system comprehensively, that it's not just saying we're getting rid of life without parole, because that can sort of be an empty promise. It's important to have second look reforms that actually allow people to go back into court after a reasonable amount of time uh, to argue for a different sentence or to have their sentences reviewed by a parole board. Next slide, please. So when we really look at the states that have enacted these second look reforms, particularly for children, it's a much different picture, right? Um, so uh, here you can see from the map, and again, Ohio and Maryland, you know, are included on this because they just recently passed their laws. But the vast majority of states have not uh, enacted true second look uh, reforms. And that's highly problematic when we're looking at uh, these de facto life sentences. And, you know, we could, however people want to term it, sentences over 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, um, you know, these are kids that also need these sorts of opportunities. Um, but in the states that have enacted them, where they have been retroactive, uh, there, again, is this great need uh, for reforms. And I hope that one of the things that people can take away even looking at this map um, is that these reforms have passed in pretty geographically and politically diverse places, right? I mean, you have Arkansas up there with North Dakota, uh, West Virginia, California, and Oregon. Um, and so what that really tells us is that this is an issue that can be bipartisan, that you can garner both Republican and Democratic support in. Um, and, you know, as long as the messaging is right and the framing is right, um, you know, and I also want to highlight that, you know, I think sometimes in, in progressive communities, we have this tendency to think that we have to get everything all at once or like it doesn't matter. Um, but it, it, the important thing for folks to know is that, and you know, and I worked on, you know, I think all of these laws that that are on the map there, except in California uh, and, and Colorado, um, but, you know, the, all of these reforms, you know, were the sort of foundational piece that then allowed uh, folks to go back in and build upon that. So Nicole was talking before about the second look reforms in D.C., um, in California, you know, those passed after advocates had successfully gotten this opportunity afforded to youth. And so, you know, that's critical too, I think, in understanding the way that policymakers often think about this. People are hesitant, especially when you start talking about murder, sex offenses, violent offenses, uh, to expand that to anybody. But once you can get them there on brain development, on trauma, particularly when it comes to children, and using that frame, it's not that far of a leap for them to understand, oh, this brain development doesn't stop until somebody's 26, right? Uh, this trauma has an impact on everybody, regardless of whether they're a child when they committed their crime or not, right? So understanding sort of how all this fits together and building off of the reforms that have been enacted in some of these other states, right? So that's really, really important and understanding the key to, to what true second look really, really means. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, you know, as folks are thinking about this in the context of, you know, your own home state, um, the biggest factors are going to be, you know, political climate and political will to, to pass these. And, and again, I always tell people, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, you can always build off of, of these reforms. And what you oftentimes see is a willingness and a yearning oftentimes on the part of policymakers once they've bought in and once they've had that taste of victory, like, oh, I just banned life without parole sentences for kids. Like, what else can I do? Like, what else can I build support for? Oh, like, what? Why don't we make this retroactive now, right? So, you know, the biggest thing is figuring out what what is it in your state that you can get to work um, and how far you can go in a given legislative cycle and whether or not, you know, the system is going to be judicial or parole review. Um, and again, that can be dictated sometimes by the circumstances on the ground. When we were working in North Dakota, I'll give you just a, a brief example of this. Um, we started off with a bill that was going to, you know, provide a parole review to everybody after after 20 years um, and, and life without parole sentences for children. Uh, we couldn't get the political will uh, to get that bill passed. And so we had to completely scrap that bill, uh, reframe it and do a judicial second look legislation. For whatever reason, people were more comfortable with that because they thought, well, judges still have have the ability to impose life without parole on the front end. And then if they want 20 years later, they can go back and change that sentence. And even though, you know, in our mind, it was the same thing, right? It was important for uh, those policymakers to, you know, preserve, you know, traditional life without parole as they saw it um, and use the judges as the mechanism by which they, they provided these second look opportunities. So it really sometimes just depends on the place where you're working, uh, the strategies that you know, are gonna be the most effective in getting this passed. And also, you know, what is gonna be the most effective? Sometimes pro boards are the more meaningful route, particularly if you have judges who are elected in your state. Yeah, it's a tough thing to go back in and advocate for a second chance when a judge is gonna be up for election in a couple of years. So just important key considerations to keep in mind if you're working on these sorts of reforms in your state of, of you know, how you wanna go about actually structuring the program. Sometimes pro boards are awful. Um, for a long time, you know, we got this bill passed when I was over at my old organization, the Campaign for the Fair Sentence of Youth. We got this bill passed in West Virginia. It was parole review after 15 years. This was 2014. Nothing like this had ever been done before, right? It was the most comprehensive reform in the history of the United States when it came to children. Uh, but it was a paper tiger. We couldn't get anybody paroled. There was a horrific parole board. Thankfully, Hopefully a new governor came in, um, as, uh, assigned new people to the pro board, and in that first year they decreased their uh, life or population by 50%, right? So there are all these key considerations that are really important uh, when determining which system is going to be the most effective at actually making sure people come home, because that's the name of the game. Um, next slide, please. I know I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to um, I'm going to wrap up my my arguments here pretty quickly. Um, but compelling arguments I have up on the screen, you know, particularly as it relates to children, you know, juvenile brain and behavioral science, anybody who's read the Miller, Graham, or Montgomery decisions are going to be well versed in that. Trauma as a significant mitigating factor, again, the reframing of this conversation and allowing children who've experienced, you know, uh, horrible things in their life to actually own the victim status that, that belongs to them, right? And not allowing other people to take that away from them. Um, you know, the Supreme Court cases, as I mentioned, human rights standards, Article 37 of the CRC. Um, and uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and religion and redemption. There's a lot of Republicans who support these re reforms because they believe in the fundamental principle of redemption and second chances. And so it's really important not to write your state off just because you might live in a conservative region. You actually might find that it's actually more, e it's easier to get those reforms passed in those states than it is in blue states. I'll tell you, I work, I'd rather work in North Dakota any day of the week than in Illinois, which is, you know, night and day blue and red. It's much easier to get people to buy into that because they believe in the concept of redemption and second chances. And then uh, common sense. It's about balancing public safety uh, with treating people differently and how everything we know about the youth and young people, right? So it's really important to own that space. These are common sense reforms. Don't let you know the politics of fear and anger drive these uh, conversations. I want to highlight one thing. Um, don't talk about saving money. Yeah, people always do it. They always think, oh, Republicans are buying this. When it comes to public safety, it doesn't matter how much money you have to spend, right? So like, that's the idea. If people think like their communities are in danger, how much money they spend is never gonna matter. What is gonna matter is people change, grow over time. Uh, we need to balance common sense reforms with you know public safety. Um, and that's, that's really important. Um, last slide. 
and then pending reforms, I just want to highlight, uh, Nicole talked about uh, the reform by Senator Booker. Um, there's also a bill Senator by Senator Durbin and Grassley, Senate Bill 1014, Section 201, is the judicial sentencing look back provision. Uh, Congressman Bruce Westerman is a Republican from the 4th Congressional District of Arkansas. For those that aren't in the know, that's the former seat of Senator Tom Cotton, um, who sponsored the same legislation over on the House side. So again, politics doesn't always matter in this. Sometimes it's just the right thing to do, especially for people who believe in second chances for youth. Last slide, I think this is, there you go. Thank you all so much. I look forward to the conversation afterwards. Thank you so much, David. I, I actually just wanna uh, tune in here on the whole issue of religion and redemption. And also I would add family issues that I think that these all speak to Republican legislatures. Um, and I will say in my years of visiting prisons, which didn't really start until 2014, I was struck that really the only people who consistently visited people in prison came from church groups. And um, in developing a lot of my release plans for clemency applicants under uh, CP 2014, I found religious groups were pivotal in helping me build uh, sort of, you know, integrated and cohesive release strategies. So I, I'm, I'm, I appreciate that you mentioned that. Um, okay, thanks so much. Over to you, David, thank you. Yeah, just to go on what you were talking about uh, as far as the release strategies, uh, we all know the Africa proverb where it says it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, my spin on that is it takes a village for a returning citizen to be successful. And that village includes the person's family, the person's uh, community, uh, especially faith communities, employers, and support groups, you know, so it's definitely important to have that faith component there. Um, another thing as far as what James was talking about, when it comes to the brain development, you know, here in Pennsylvania, we have 5,447 people serving life without parole. 73% of those people committed their offense before they were 25. 50% committed their offense before they were 21. Uh, you can go to the first slide. And so that's why, you know, both James and I talk about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, because it's, it's so powerful. You know, there's a, a pipeline that a lot of people talk about. You know, they talk about the school to prison pipeline, but there's a trauma to prison pipeline that so many people experience this adverse childhood experiences, these situations that cause them to get into addiction that uh, causes their mental health issues to get worse, you know, and the thing that the U.S. doesn't do is it doesn't um, work with people as far as addictions. It doesn't work with people with mental health addiction. Uh, uh, issues. We criminalize them, you know, and we send them to prison when we should be sending them to programs to get the help that they need. Um, probably in 2019, 2020, we have heard more about trauma-informed care and the need to deal with trauma. And uh, we can go back to the 70s and 80s when mass incarceration really blew up. And this is a time that we didn't look at trauma. We didn't look at the situations that led people to commit offenses. The 90s, we wanted to consider people super predators, but we didn't want to look at the situation and what was happening in their home, what had led them to the streets and the life that they were living. My brother and I are a perfect example of this trauma to prison pipeline. We were sexually and physically abused for, for eight years and we took the person's life uh when i've taken the aces test i've scored 10 out of 10 and that's saying that i've had all this uh experiences that happened to me individually but also to our family as a whole and, and most people with this type of score have ended up in prison or multiple suicide attempts or have ended up dead, you know, and I ended up prison and I've had the suicide attempts too. And so what we have to realize is that our system is not set up to help individuals who have these adverse childhood experiences. So here we have a system that allows individuals to experience these horrific experiences as children, then they go to prison and we know that prison adds trauma to that. So you have somebody experience trauma as a child, 
then they're arrested and they're experiencing more trauma and then they're released and we expect them to just immediately be okay, you know, and just like uh, snap a finger and you're perfect, you know, and, and that's not the case. And so you can go to the next slide. And so the next slide is just a, a example of the test, you know, and I would recommend that everybody, when we get done with this, just to take this test to, to see where you are as far as this, you know, and it might surprise you as far as the trauma that you've actually experienced. And that's one thing that is baffling to people who have never taken this test and they sit down and take it to see where they score on it. You can go to the next slide. And so what we have to do is we have to look at this. I mean, prison is not about healing. It's not about corrections. It's not about rehabilitation, you know. Prisons add to that trauma because we expect prison to be this place that is going to rehabilitate somebody. But uh, all you have to do is look at places like Alabama, which in the past two months has had over 20 people die from suicide, from murder, from overdose. If prisons are about corrections and rehabilitation, we wouldn't be having these large amount of deaths. Um, James said something that, that I always talk about too, hurt people, hurt people. Um, there's, uh, when I went through a behavior modification program in prison, it talked about the trauma breeds anger. So here we have individuals who dealt with this adverse trauma, and now they're in this situation where they're having more anger, you know, and there's no way to release it. I mean, seeing counselors, is is a joke you know i only saw a psychologist one time in prison i was in there for 50 minutes 45 minutes he was talking about the picture on his wall and just broke down the whole reason for it and i'm thinking okay i signed up here to come see you and to begin working on my issues you know my healing from the abuse and everything actually came through doing self-help reading myself you know and looking at what happened to me and just realizing that I wasn't to blame for the trauma and the experiences, you know, and to go on to the, the aspect about hurt people, hurt people, I, I add two parts to it. I say helped people, help people, and healed people, heal people. And, and that's why I love being able to share my story in places like this and in universities, because it's important to have somebody who has had my type of experiences, because so many people come up afterwards and talk about how they are empowered to share about the, their own trauma, you know, and, and that's one thing we need in prisons. We need to have individuals like James and myself and others who have experienced this trauma to go and to speak to these men and to these women and to begin that healing process, because when that healing process begins, that's when we're going to see more people come out and the recidivism rate won't be 65%. And I mean, when we think about mental health issues in prison, uh, there was one prison down in Alabama, 85% of the people in this prison were on psychotropic medication. That was about 850 people on psychotropic medication. That should not be the case. You know, why do we have so many people on medication? All they want to do is medicate somebody where they don't have to deal with them and deal with the issues that they have. We can go to the next slide. So the work that I do here in Pennsylvania is we're doing work around um, life without parole and geriatric parole uh, and medical parole. And one of the things that we're dealing with and, and that we're highlighting are is this thought about dual victims. And dual victims are family members who have lost somebody to gun violence and also have a family member who has gone to prison for a murder, you know? And what is so amazing when we're having conversations about life without parole, we're having conversations about virtual life sentences, is people are always like, what about the victims? It's like, okay, here's a perfect example of somebody who has experienced both aspects. And People are always like, uh, uh, and this population is not the anomaly. This is something that has happened all the time. We've been in conversations where we were actually speaking with a representative and one of her staffers is a dual victim. And it's just like, wow, you know, you would not think that this individual working with a representative was a dual victim, but that's the thing. I mean, crime, it, it doesn't, 
say, okay, you're this type of population. I want to affect you. It affects everybody in places, you know, especially like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, it's higher, you know, especially for the black and brown communities, as James was talking about, you know, the, the crime rates, the, the dual victims there are higher, you know, and that's what we have to look at. Uh, next slide. And I, I was able to write an article about uh, the new 55 and over community and hospice and, and the situation there in prison. Um, they'll probably put the, the link to it today. And that's really what we have to look at. You know, these second look sentencing are going to help the elders that are in prison. You know, there's over 10,000 people who are over 50 years old in Pennsylvania's prison. That's over 25% of the prison population. In the United States, this population is at 30%. And it's the fastest growing population in prison. And it's not because we have a crime wave of people that are 55 to 60 years old. It's because of life without parole sentences. It's because of life sentences. And it's because of these virtual life sentences. And there's really no mechanism in place right now to really release them. And uh, the, the parole boards do have the possibility at times, but you can look at parole boards across the country. They're there's some states that are doing horrible right now as far as releasing folks, you know? And so that's what we have to do. We have to come up with other mechanisms to allow this ind these individuals to be released. Uh, at age 50, according to the ACLU, the, the price, the, the cost of incarcerating somebody doubles. Just in Pennsylvania alone, the, the cost of uh, medication for somebody that's over 50 a month is $3.2 million. That's just one month, you know, so there's different stats like that, you know, it definitely costs a lot more money to uh, house this population. Uh, next slide. So here in Pennsylvania, we, we actually have two, uh, there's two Senate bills right now that we're working on getting passed. The first one is SB 135, and it would allow those individuals with life without parole sentences to be eligible for parole after 35 years, those serving second degree to be eligible after 25 years. And the geriatric parole SB 835, which was just introduced last week, would allow parole eligibility after 25 years for those 55 and or served half their sentence. And I mean, it's, not what the second look is as far as like the 10 years, but right now with the makeup, as James was talking about, is you, you have to look at the makeup of the legislator that you're at, you know, and these are pushing, you know, the SB 135 is something that we're having a lot of pushback on, but the geriatric medical parole is something that seems like there's a lot more acceptance to because they're looking at these frail and older men, you know, and the cost of housing them. Um, uh, David, are you done? Sorry. Yeah. I don't, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, it's sort of interesting that you ended your talk talking about the money issue and James had ended his talk by saying, don't talk about the money, but I, I, I'm not saying this is inconsistent. I completely, um, hear you when it comes to, especially the elderly population, that that is, um, uh, language that a legislature hears. Um, you talk a lot, really, I think at the end of the day of much of your discussion, talked about that restorative process, just about really the humanity of treating individuals as well, human beings that are capable of rehabilitation, but also redemption. And do you want to talk a little bit about or all of you actually talk a little bit about restorative justice, because I think at the heart of Second Look is restorative justice. And because over 50% of our state population are in custody for violence, you know, which is really the insight of um, Jonathan Pfaff's book, that um, we really have to grapple with the idea that if we're going to reduce mass incarceration, we also have to allow people out who have ostensibly been convicted of violence. Does anybody want to talk about that? And I'm not going to, there, there is a slide there about the NACDL proposed legislation. I don't think we need to go there. I'd much prefer to us just to have this last moment to talk about everything that's um, been raised. Yeah, I'll weigh in and, you know, I just look forward to hearing what David and James have to say too. I think, I think understanding what the capacity is for restorative justice and what remedies um, are needed to address the continued well-being of the crime survivor and also the person who committed the harm is what's needed. I think that there are examples of this that happen 
on an individual basis, supporting efforts that can build out this infrastructure so that judges and other legal practitioners know that you know the various people impacted by a crime, particularly an egregious one, can be served by the criminal legal system in a way that doesn't have to disappear people away to prison. So I uh, always gravitate towards stories like this. I know that every once in a while there will be a, um, an example of a crime survivor who befriends, has some ongoing relationship with the person that might have harmed them, might have killed their loved one, or, or some other harm that they might have experienced. I think understanding that those experiences are a part of this conversation and then working to support an infrastructure that can help accommodate and expand that it's what's needed. Perhaps in the context of second look reforms, they're prioritizing public resources towards expanding um, those types of efforts is, is another part of this advocacy. And then where it is currently happening, defense attorneys may know this, right? There might be an case by case example of restorative justice experiences and then building out that network, building out that narrative to understand that th this is happening, getting supporting expansion of it is what's needed. And then having this be a part of the ongoing conversation that can help recalibrate the punitive sentences can hopefully um, you know, lead to change and lead to applying the recommendations and solutions that we're all proposing. So I would also recommend, uh, Danielle Sarid runs a program in New York called uh, Common Justice. Definitely take a look into that. Uh, she wrote a book called Until We Reckon. And then also, you know, here I am, somebody that was sexually, physically abused. I took the person's life. But the first job I got when I graduated college was I became program director of a of a Christian reentry home that worked with people who had committed sexual offenses. So here I am working with the, in essence, what you would consider the enemy, you know, but I didn't look at it that way. You know, I looked at my job as living out restorative justice, you know, and I made the conscious decision to look at the person, not as a sex offender, but as a person who committed a sexual offense. And so what I did was I separated the person from the offense and I didn't judge them on whatever act they committed five, 10, 20 years ago. And that's really where we have to get at. We have to get to the point where we don't define somebody by the act that they committed. If I was still defined by the act committed, I would call myself a murderer because of the offense that happened in June, 1999. It's been over 22 years, you know, and I'm not that same person. And uh, I have an eight month old baby, you know, and if you ask people that know me, they wouldn't say, oh yeah, he's this violent uh, offender and this and that. They'd be like, he's this big teddy bear that acts crazy around his baby, you know? And that's what it is, you know, looking at me as who I am today, not as the offense that I happen. So that's really the dichotomy that we have to get away from. And we have to get away from this violent of offender versus nonviolent offender. People that are incarcerated are people that are incarcerated. We can't judge them by the worst thing that they've ever done. I mean, that's what Brian Stevenson says. James, did you want to add something there? I think David, David and Nicole did a great job of, I think, capturing the essence of sort of justice, yeah. Um, there was one thing in the chat that I thought I would bring out. It was a, uh, somebody who is at the Brandon Center or uh, was talking about something at the Brandon Center. It's something called the Reverse uh, Criminal Justice Act, where instead of giving money to states for as long as they show the amount of criminal stats they have, you actually threaten to take federal dollars away unless they show that they're doing something about mass incarceration. Um, be a great bill if we could get it passed, but um, what do you think about the chances of us being able to get bipartisan support for this idea that mass incarceration is really something we have to put serious thought into and make some tough choices um, to fix? I mean, I'll just briefly talk, you know, Congress is, is rough. Um, 
<laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, it, you know, you got to get 60 votes in the Senate. And I, I will say that, you know, for folks that are interested, I mean, and not only that, but then also the population in, in, in the federal system, you know, is dwarfed by what's happening at the state level. Um, and, and so while I think the idea is, is, you know, it's good to be innovative and in thinking about ways we can reverse the trend. Um, you know, I think that everything at the federal level is inherently much more partisan and so harder, it's much harder to get support for. Um, so, I mean, just the politics of it, I will say it's a super complicated, right? Um, you can have a lot easier effort, I think, at the state level, getting folks to pass these reforms. You know, like the map that I highlighted before, I think people would be shocked. They'd be like, oh, wow, it's like Arkansas has been out in front of them. And that bill passed nearly unanimously. Um, the same thing with a lot of these reforms. And so it's a lot easier to talk, you know, have reasonable conversations with folks outside of the specter of a big spotlight that, that Congress has on it. So um, I know that doesn't answer the question directly, but it's just what I'd highlight about the inherent problems with the politics in Congress right now. Hey, let me suggest maybe we should incentivize states and localities to adopt second look reforms. Um, that could be that could be an approach. I do think it's going to be a challenge for to uh, pull money away from states who don't adopt something progressively. Per, perhaps working to incentivize some of the you know the adoption of some of these new progressive norms is uh, you know could have some positive outcomes. Well, I think, um, Monica, am I right that we're at the end of our segment? It was one hour, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I, one thing that was very salient to me, I think, in this whole discussion was the power of storytelling. It sounds sort of a little cheap to say that, but it really is true that putting a face on, on a, a concept, you know, the idea of a redeemed individual who spent time in custody, somebody who successfully re-entered. We can talk about that in theory, but until it's really encapsulated in a story, or when we talk about people whose crimes resulted in utterly draconian sentences that are completely disproportionate to the facts, the mitigating facts involved. Again, the stories of individual cases can um, really move people. And I think that at the very least, one of the things we can do is really try to create mechanisms for getting these stories out there. Um, that's one way to drive that uh, push to get um, state, legal justice reform. Any final comments, anybody, if we still have people on? Nicole, David, James. <laughs> I thought this was a great discussion. Thank you all for having it again. Yeah, thank you all. This was wonderful. And I, I hope it gave people a lot of um, food for thought and uh, some inspiration going forward. <laughs>